Oh, good to see you. Mm. <sighs> okay, we're going to make a start. Welcome everyone who's uh, joining us on Zoom, in our Zoom meeting. Uh, we've got a few who are away today, some are on holiday, and I think uh, during the month of August we're going to have uh, more and more who are away on holiday, taking the opportunity that we now have, which now seems like a privilege, doesn't it, to be able to leave our home and go away on holidays for those of us who are able to. And there's some who uh, are not able to be here for other reasons this morning. But hello to everyone who's with us on our Zoom meeting and those who are joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, it's good to have you with us. Welcome. This uh, morning service comes from Trinity Baptist Church in Gorton. Not in our church building, but buildings are not churches. Church is the people and the people, friends, members, uh, people who are part of Trinity Baptist Church in Gorton. Welcome you. My name's Wayne Clark. I'm the pastor at Trinity Baptist Church in Gorton, and uh, my wife Val Clark is going to be leading most of our service this morning. I'm going to be handing over to her in a minute. Um, we hope that you can join us in Christian fellowship, whether you're a part of our church or whether you're a Christian who's part of another church, whether you have Christian faith or whether you are not uh, a practicing Christian, but you'd like to find out more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We hope you'll stay with us as today we are continuing to think about the parables, the, the stories that Jesus told that have uh, a significant meaning about Jesus and his kingdom and the way in which he wants us to live as uh, those who are his followers. Let's begin with a prayer. Father God, we pray that you will be with us as we gather now in the name of Jesus, our King. We pray that you will be with us wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever we've been doing throughout the that this day so far. Uh, we want to leave behind the burdens of today and whatever is weighing on our shoulders and weighing on our minds this morning and say that, Father, we simply want to concentrate on you and the things of your kingdom and join together with your people this morning. Help us to concentrate. It's not always easy when we've just got a screen in front of us. But help us, Lord, to turn our hearts and minds to you, that we may be united with your people this morning in fellowship. We pray for Val as she leads us this morning. We pray for those who are on holiday or are doing other important things, working or have other engagements this morning. We pray for your blessing on them. And that all of us, Lord, may know the love of your Holy Spirit binding us together and of the Lord Jesus guiding us and directing us as we come into the Father's presence now. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, Val is going to be leading us and we pray that uh, Val will uh, know God's presence in all that she does and says. So I'm going to hand over to Val now. Hi everybody. Thank you, Wayne. The psalmist says this, it's good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. Well, we may not have a ten-string lyre or a harp um, at the moment, but let's Praise our God anyway and, and rejoice in his faithfulness as we sing from the screen. Um, as we sing from the screen, um, great is your faithfulness. i 
thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. And all I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord. That's great. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are a faithful God. That we can rely on you, whatever the situation. Whether times are good or whether times are bad. You're there. You hear us. We thank you that you provide so much for us. This world, Lord, that we've all come to appreciate a lot more over the last months. Our family, our friends, who some of us are still not seeing. Everything that you give to us, we want to thank you for. And to acknowledge that without you, we would have nothing, we would be nothing. And Father, because you've given us so much, we want to confess that sometimes we're not as thankful as we should be. We want to acknowledge that sometimes we forget that you are our Lord and our King. Sometimes we put ourselves first. And we know that even though uh, this time has brought out all kinds of generosities and kindnesses, um, we're also aware, Lord, of, of how self-centered we've become. And, and I pray, Lord, that you would help us to get that right balance. We thank you that you have sent Jesus into this world so that we can um, be rescued from our sin, that he would uh, take the punishment and the blame and through him we can have a new life. Lord, we pray that today we would know that you have um, forgiven us our sins. Today we would start afresh and live out for you um, in everything that we do. 
whether we're um, seemingly by ourselves or whether we're with others. We pray, Lord, that um, everything that we do, we would do it for you, that you would be glorified um, through the actions that we take and the decisions that we make. We thank you and praise you that you are a good and loving, faithful and forgiving God. Amen. I'm going to sing again um, a song that acknowledges um, that Jesus is our Lord and our King, uh, that it is his church that we're part of um, and what it is that he wants the church to be. Come set your rule and reign. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives, for you are our joy and prize, to see the captive hearts release, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down. Church, we pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on. Show you. 
I'm uh, say a few more things. Okay, coming to me now. Then, if that's uh, if you can get the camera over to me. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, thank you, Val, for leading us so far. We're going to be going back to Val in a moment. I've just got one or two uh, admin things to say and some pastoral items to share with you. First of all, for those of you who haven't heard, I'm sure you all have heard, but uh, perhaps some of you on Facebook Live who, uh, who are part of our church may not have heard this. Some very sad news, really, that one of our church members has passed away gone to be with our Lord this week, and that's Chris Hammond, uh, who died on Tuesday, peacefully, surrounded by her family, but just a few, what seems like a few short weeks since she was diagnosed with uh, cancer, inoperable cancer of her liver and other organs. She'd, she'd had problems with um, particular parts uh, of her body for, for months and years, but they didn't think it was cancer. And then she was diagnosed with cancer and sadly passed away this week. Uh, she'd been in hospital for a few weeks, but was able to go back home to her, her son's house and be surrounded by her family where she passed away. But dying in, in confidence of her Lord, who she, she knew and knew for many years and walked with him and uh, knowing that he was with her, I was able to see her just a few days before she died and uh, sing and pray and, and read the scriptures to her. And she knew that um, we as a church were with her in prayer in her last days. So uh, with sadness, we commit her to the Lord. Chris's funeral is on Thursday. That's this Thursday, the 13th of August at one o'clock. It's being held at Stockport Crematorium in the Rowan Chapel there. But but there's always a but, I'm afraid, at this at the current time. Uh, because of um, current restrictions, only 30 people are allowed into the Rowan Chapel, which really means family only. I think uh, a couple of members of our church have been personally invited by the family to attend, but others will not be allowed, will not be uh, uh, allowed into the uh, chapel I'm afraid but um, because of um, restrictions um, others will not be allowed into the chapel but you will be allowed to gather outside the chapel if you want to be there that's at Stockport Crematorium Rowan Chapel at one o'clock on Thursday you can gather outside to hear the service relayed on speakers if you want to be there the other alternative if you want to um, remember Chris uh, on the day of her funeral is that the cortege, the, the funeral procession will be leaving Chris's house, which is in Gorton uh, for Williams Street. Uh, you can go there on Thursday as, the, uh, as she leaves the house. Um, that's, uh, that will be, I don't know the exact time, but if you get there at about 12 o'clock, it will be between 12 and 12.15, probably about that time. I would think if you were there at 12 or just before, you'd be in, in good time for that. And neighbors will be coming out of the house uh, and uh, friends from Gorton will also be there to, to wish Chris and her family well. And there'll be a sort of round of applause on the street as I understand it. So you may want to go there to Williams Street, which is uh, off Hyde Road, the other side of Hyde Road from the church. Um, just down from Gorton Evangelical Church, uh, if you don't know where that is, uh, you'll find you'll find others there from 12 o'clock, um, maybe a bit earlier, but I think 12 o'clock to quarter past will be about the right time. Uh, I'll try and keep you posted on that. If there's any change in the timing of that, uh, I'll put that on the church's Facebook page. But please pray for Chris's family, her sons, Philip and Richard and Richard's wife, Sam, and their children, Jade and Harley. Harley's only 13 and he's taking it particularly badly. And Chris also has uh, four surviving sisters and brothers. Uh, please pray for the family and for all close friends. Um, sad time, sad time. Let me tell you about things that are happening in the life of the church over the next uh, week or two. We're continuing Facebook Live broadcasts on Tuesday and Thursday at 12 o'clock. I'll be doing the one on Tuesday 
because of Chris's funeral, Val will be taking them on on Thursday. We'll be doing uh, looking at the next couple of passages in the first letter of John. We're still in chapter two of one John. We're going through it in small bits, uh, reading a few verses and thinking about them and then having a time of prayer. That's at 12 o'clock on Facebook Live on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, that will be this week and then, uh, but, but not the next couple of weeks because Val and I will not be available for those. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be back here on uh, Facebook Live and on Zoom. We're on Zoom from about quarter past 10 and then on Facebook Live from 10.45 next Sunday, where I'll be leading uh, next Sunday. I'll be taking next Sundays on another parable of Jesus. Two weeks today, uh, I'm not going to be here and things are going to be a bit different. We're going to be having a, a, a Zoom uh, prayer time. We'll still be gathering as a church, but we'll be more emphasis on prayer and uh, Rachel's going to be leading a prayer time on Zoom, but we're not going to be sharing that onto Facebook Live, so I'm afraid there will not be a Facebook Live service two weeks today, but we are encouraging people on Facebook still to be praying for the church and for things important to us as a church. So that's two weeks today. Don't forget the uh, phone message, Trinity phone message is on uh, 0161509409. Where you can hear a recorded message you can still tell others about that and uh the weekly church email will be going out next friday if you've got any pastoral needs any other concerns please do stay in touch with one another and do stay in touch with with me and i will make sure those things get to other people that's uh church admin uh, it, it's i know it sounds a bit dull but it's a way of keeping us together at this time to make sure we're staying in touch with one another so the Lord bless you. Now let's open up my microphones for anyone who has birthdays or other significant times to share. I know it's A-level results on Thursday, so that may be significant for some of us. I know uh, I was talking to uh, Ola, Faith's mum, this week, and it's, uh, she's Faith's looking forward to A-level results this Thursday. Uh, any other family news, but particularly birthdays you've got to share? Anyone on the Zoom meeting, please speak up or um, anyone else on Facebook with anything to share, please tell us. Anyone got anything to share? No, doesn't look like it. Marie shaking her head. Precious is, oh, Precious is leaving. John, anyone in your family got anything to share? No. I don't think there is anything then. Well, God bless you. And uh, pray for those who've got A-level results this week. Can't hear you, Val. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you very much for, for sharing all that. Um, yes, please keep all of what Wayne's mentioned um, in your prayers. I'm going to hand over to Jude and John now, um, who are going to bring us our readings. Um, the first reading is from Luke 12. And it continues looking at, at one of Jesus's parables. And then the second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Um, and you'll see, you'll see the link um, uh, as, as soon as the, those, those passages are read. So um, Jude and John, if you wouldn't mind um, reading those passages for us, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I'm reading first, Luke chapter 12, verse 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an abide between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There will I store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, 
You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then he will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. The second reading is from Second Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six to thirteen. Remember this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided to. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge in the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Jude. Um, we're going to sing now a song that's about the uh, that parable. It's called Bigger Barn. I, I, I assure you, this will stay in your, your brain for the next week. But 
God said, how foolish Tonight you're going to die Then who gets your fortune When you say your last goodbye Don't store up your wealth or So don't you build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb, build a bigger bomb, bigger bomb, bomb, bigger bomb. I love that. <laughs> you know, I've never really understood that parable. I mean, I understand the parable, I understand the meaning of it, but I've never really understood why Jesus told it and what he meant by it. This man seems eminently sensible to me. I mean, if you've not got enough space for something, then you make space for it, don't you? I mean, you know, you buy a bigger wardrobe if you've got too many clothes, or you buy more Billy bookcases if you've got too many books. Eminently sensible. But there must have been a reason why Jesus told the story. So let's look at it. Let's take a closer look at the story. First of all, a man approaches Jesus to ask him to adjudicate in a dispute between him and his brother about their inheritance. And we don't know what his situation was. Perhaps he was the youngest son and he wasn't going to get as much as his older brother. Certainly, he wasn't getting as much as he wanted. So what did the wise rabbi, Jesus, have to say in this situation? You can imagine the crowd all around, standing there agog with bated breath, waiting for him to deliver King Solomon's style wisdom. What's he going to say? How's he going to answer? Don't be greedy, is basically what Jesus says. Don't be greedy. Stop coveting. And then he tells this story. A man's harvest was so big that he thought he would need more space to store it all. Fair enough. Wise man. But let's just look at it. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. This man's only thought was for himself. There's about a hundred words in that story. Twelve of them are personal pronouns relating to that man. Apparently it was tradition in that community for individuals to always consult with others when making major decisions. People in their family, people in the community, and particularly if it was to do with building, consultation, getting advice from others. This man didn't do that. 
he just made the decision by himself. He talked to himself. The farm brought forth a huge harvest. Something he'd probably never experienced before. But did he thank God? Did he make mention of the fact that it was God who provided the rain and the sunshine and made it grow? Did he think to give to him the first fruits? making the traditional sacrifice that acknowledged that everything came from God. He didn't say thank you to his farm workers. No mention of a bonus for them, for all the hard work that they've done that year. And there's no thought of sharing the harvest, of giving to those in need, even selling it to others. He just wanted to hoard it, to store it. And maybe this is where I ought to mention that um, before I'm allowed to buy more wardrobes or Billy bookcases, there's always a big clear out in our house. And items are either given away, they're binned, they're recycled, or they're put in bags for Oasis or other charities. And because I have the fortunate position of being in the Oasis shop when people buy things, it always gives me a real thrill when somebody buys something that I've donated. But this man doesn't even consider other people. He doesn't even think that people might be able to make use of his old barns. He just pulls them down rips them down to replace them with bigger and better. And I get the feeling that he'd have done it the next year if it had happened the next year. Bigger and better, bigger and better. And what's it all for? To take life easy, to eat, drink and be merry. Now, excuse me, I've got a drink at the moment. <coughs> well, there's nothing wrong with easing off. Nothing wrong with enjoying the good things in life. There's not even anything wrong in being rich. Now, what was wrong here was this man's priorities. He was rich, he was a hard worker, but his whole existence was about himself. He forgot that he lived in a world where he relied on others and others relied on him as we all do. Let's just remind ourselves how many people you have already relied on this morning to get you to this point in the morning. When you got out of bed, had a wash, cleaned your teeth, you used water that came through your bathroom. You used toothpaste that somebody had made. I've never tried making toothpaste myself. Soap that somebody else had made. You got dressed in clothes that probably you bought, or if, if you didn't buy the clothes, then at least you bought the materials to make them. You had breakfast that were, was provided by so many other people around the world. We have all relied on a whole host of people to get to where we are today. And just our technology the technology that we're using to be able to speak and listen to each other now. This man did not put his priorities right. In the words of Martin Luther King, he had maximized the minimum and minimized the maximum. I like that phrase, remember it. He'd maximized the minimum. He made more of something that shouldn't have been made more of and he'd made little of something that sh should be made great of. He had no thought for others, he had no thought for God. What has he gained? No sooner has he made his plans than he dies. He can't take his wealth with him and he has no say, as God reminds him, 
over what's done with it now. God called him a fool. And I'm reminded of other parts of the Bible where the, the word fool or foolish is used. In the Psalms, there's the verse, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And that's what this man's doing. He's living his life as if God doesn't exist. And again, often in the Old Testament, people are referred to as being foolish when they don't follow God's ways. When they live their lives ignoring God. And when we live our lives ignoring God and not looking out for others, we too are foolish. So how, how do we become wise? Well, again, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if we don't want to be a fool, we put God first. There are two lessons, I think, to be learned from this parable. The first is quite simply, don't devote yourselves to gathering and accumulating wealth. Don't make it your life's aim. Jesus says, and I've paraphrased it, devote yourself to God in his kingdom, and if wealth comes, then so be it. Get our priorities right. Don't live for gaining stuff, for having stuff. Why do we want it? Maybe we need to ask that question. There's something that we want. Why? Do we need it? Is it the best use of our money? Is it right to have it now? In this age where we want everything now, and people don't save up for things, is it right to have it now? If I buy something, will this purchase cause any problems? Will it mean that there's need in another area? Will it cause contention with those that I live with and those that I love? Will it cause me to go into debt? Whenever debt is referred to in the Bible, by the way, it's never a good thing. It's something that is so easy for us these days, isn't it? Stick it on the credit card, stick it on the credit card. But debt in the Bible is never a good thing. And Jesus says that we can't serve God and money. And the Sermon on the Mount said to be one of the, the greatest um, lessons, if you like, for life. Jesus mentions money and debt and riches so many times. Matthew 6 and Luke 16, both of which are, are that sermon, have so much about money. And did you know that 11 of the 40 or so parables that there are in the Bible are about money? Jesus had a lot to say about it because he knew how important it could become in our lives. He didn't say it was a bad thing to have it. He said it was a bad thing to put it first. We need to maximize the maximum and minimize the minimum. So the first lesson is don't devote yourself to gathering and accumulating wealth. If God chooses to give it to us, then so be it. 
The second lesson is that we haven't been blessed by God to hoard and to build up a supply of wealth. But we have been blessed by God to be a blessing to others and to build the kingdom. That passage that Jude read to us has this verse in it. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, Paul was talking here about uh, people who were, were gathering money um, within their congregations and sending it to Paul uh, for him to use. Uh, so that's why it talks about um, through us, uh, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. But notice what it says. It says you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. We're given wealth and good things so that we can have the joy of blessing others. I love the phrase in that that says, we can enlarge the harvest of our righteousness. I want to enlarge the harvest of my righteousness. So how do we deal with our wealth? Well, firstly, we give back to God. We give him the first fruits. That, that may, for, for some of us, that may be a tithe. Um, others may not tithe, but always our first fruits are to be given. What he, he wants from us, the very best, the very first of what we have. And we need to make offerings to him of all that we have and let him guide us and lead us in what we should do and how we should use what we have. So we need to give to his church and to the work that is being done in his name in this world. So are you currently giving to your church? Or have you for some reason stopped because of the pandemic? Um, certainly at Trinity, you can pay um, online. Or you can um, send, send money to, um, to our treasurer. But certainly paying online. So we need to give to the work of God in this world. And then we need to look at how we're using our money. We need to pray about how we're using our money. Remember the parable of the talents. Whoops, straying into another parable there, but it's better to use our wealth than just let it sit in barns or a hole in the ground or banks. So pray about how to use the money that God has given you. Paul says it's more blessed to give than to receive. So how can we bless others with what we have? How can we be generous? What can we share? The more we have, the Bible says, the more is expected of us. And even though times might be tight for us here, for most of us, we are rich compared to so many in this world. It doesn't mean that we should only be rich, uh, only be generous and give if we have a lot. Remember the widow's might or the widow at Zarephath with the last of her flour and oil and how they were willing to give. Whatever we have, let's be generous with it. And it needn't just be money and things. Although love gifts that you just give to somebody, 
can be really special, but our time and our skills and our love are things that we can also give. They're things that God has given to us. We can also be generous with our thanks, our praise, our comfort, our encouragement, our presence. We can be a real blessing to others by giving those. So who can you bless this week? Who around you needs something that you have? Mm -hmm. Remember what Jesus said about doing your good deeds in secret. Your left hand not knowing what your right hand's doing. We do feel good when we give and when we bless others, but we shouldn't use it to show off. I knew someone who was very generous with her little love gifts that she used to give to people. She didn't have much, but every so often she'd buy somebody a coffee or a bar of chocolate or bake them a cake. But she didn't keep it quiet. She would tell people what she'd done. And I used to find that that left a bitter taste in my mouth. So, what can we learn? Don't be a fool. Get your priorities right. Put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Be generous with everything, whether we're rich in money or poor in money. We've been given so much by our generous, abundant God. Share it in a way that seems right to you and to God. As God blesses us and pours good things into our lives, we've got to bless others and pour good things into their lives. We should be a bit like a teapot. God constantly filling us up and us pouring out to others. Don't be a fool. Maximize the maximum and minimize the minimum. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this story that Jesus told about this um, man who had so much, but was a fool in the way that he thought of God and the way that he thought of others. Lord, please help us not to be foolish. We thank you. We want to thank you for everything that we have. I pray, Lord, that our thankfulness and our gratitude would never run out, that it wouldn't just be a, a once a day thing or once a week thing, but that we were, our hearts would just be so full of gratitude to you. That we would remember that everything that we have and everything that we are comes from you. And then, Lord, help us to be generous with everything that you've given to us. Help us to remember that we are here to bless others. Help us to find ways of being generous to people. To do it intentionally, Lord, and not just when it happens actually make sure that we are blessing people that we are sharing what we have with people that we are being generous whether that's our wealth our things our time our love whatever it is lord help us to overflow with the abundance that you've given to us amen Going to sing our final song now. 
Um, and um, just after that, I will um, say a prayer of blessing for all those who are leaving us on Facebook. Um, and then after that, we will go into um, groups in Zoom. But we'll sing our, our final song now, which um, reminds us how we are to, to live, uh, to live out uh, the gospel that we, we have, to, to be generous to others, to share all that we have. Uh, so let's sing um, from the screen, Go Peaceful. Let's pray. Father God, please go with us now. Help us to go into the world, however limited that world may be at the moment. Um, and in all that we do, help us to be known by love. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us as we uh, go into this week that everything that we do, we would do for you. And that you would keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Val. And uh, we're going to go into prayer groups now. Jeff will split us into groups. Can I encourage you to pray for Chris Hammond's family particularly and close friends who are grieving clearly and for others that we know in our church who have 